Hello. Welcome to the Where Are They podcast channel. As a general reminder, please subscribe to our channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to be notified when new cases are published. We appreciate all the support from everyone in keeping these names out in the public eye. Please feel free to share this video and continue to spread the word of these cases. And now on to our episode. episode is going to feature Marina Bolter of Bloomingfield, Indiana. Marina was a pretty 18-year-old girl on December 31st, 2014. She clocked out of work at 6 p.m., got in a car to head home, and was never heard from again. Where is Marina? Marina Bolter was a smart child but ran into some struggles in her teen years. Not much is known about her childhood, at least from what we could uncover. So let's fast forward to her late teen years for what we do know. At the age of 17, she became pregnant, having a child in April of 2014 with boyfriend DJ Lockhart. They had an on-again, off-again relationship, but Marina's mother, Tressy, maintains that they did love each other. When Marina's child was just four months old in August of 2014, there was an unfortunate incident at home. Marina's sister Faith and Faith's boyfriend were fighting in the home, apparently a fight that turned physical. During this fight, the baby ended up being injured, being struck in the head and suffering a brain injury. The child actually had bleeding on the brain. Marina loses custody of the baby, and the child ends up going into foster care at that time. Marina would refuse to speak to her sister after this, and Faith actually went on the run afterwards. She had been on probation, and this incident had brought upon a drug test, which she failed. So at this time, Marina also became estranged from her father's side of the family, as they were helping keep Faith on the run. They were supporting her financially and they were helping her get from state to state. And Marina disagreed with this. So this caused a rift in the family. Remember, this is around August of 2014. She will end up going missing in December. So shortly before she disappears, there is a complete family breakdown. In recent months, Marina had also began having an, a, an interesting affair with an older married man that was a family friend. He helped her get an apartment and she was living on her own in hopes to establish a a residence and hopefully to become stable enough to get her child back. So Marina's living on her own in an apartment. She is working at a deli counter at an IGA grocery store. And on December 31st, 2014, Marina got off work, and was invited to a New Year's Eve party. She intended to go home, change, and then head over to this party. As she left work, she ran into her ex-boyfriend, DJ, while she was leaving the store. He tried to talk her into coming to a New Year's Eve party with him instead, but she declined. He then witnessed her getting in the car with a middle-aged man who was identified as a regular customer at the deli, And he begged her again to come to his party with him instead of this other party that she had been invited to. But she proceeded to get in the car with this other man. And this customer, who has never been publicly identified, says he dropped her off at a closed down pizza shop because Marina said she didn't want him to know where she lived. Marina's mom said this is exactly something she would say to someone and didn't necessarily find that odd at all. So this customer 
offers to give her a ride home from her IGA grocery store job. She lived about a mile away, and he was going to drop her off at this pizza shop that was no longer open, and then he was going to leave. This way he would not know where she lived. Marina's goal was to get home, get changed, and then head on over to the New Year's Eve party. Now the next day, she doesn't show up for work. Marina's boss attempted to track her down, and as her mom learned of this, she immediately drove over to Marina's apartment also. Nothing in the apartment looked disturbed, although the door was unlocked, and her wallet and cell phone were not there. The apartment looked as if she had just got up and left. Nobody really knows if she had a habit of locking the door after her, but the door was closed. It was just unlocked. There was no signs of a struggle. There was nothing that looked awry at all. So the police were notified and they begin to investigate. Right away, they go for cell phone records, but they were unable to obtain them because of the kind of cell phone that Marina had. Now, Marina's mom knew that her cell phone was from Walmart, so she took it upon herself to drive up to that store. After opening up to the store manager and letting them know what was going on, the manager at Walmart actually called the cell phone company and managed to help Marina's mom and the police retrieve that cell phone data. They discovered that her cell phone last pinged about 10 minutes after she left work but that location has not been publicized. They did say that it provided no clues to them as to where she may be, and it didn't really help in their search. First off, kudos to the store manager at Walmart for jumping in and helping. And secondly, is it odd to anyone else that the police in this case could not get the phone records, but a Walmart store manager was able to? So back at the apartment, police did not find her work clothes in her apartment. So to them, this indicated that she had not even made it home at least long enough to change clothes if she had even made it home at all. Tressie, Marina's mom, described her daughter as a little tornado and they could tell by the state of the apartment that she had not changed clothes to get ready for a party. The mother said she would have definitely been able to tell there had be a flurry of activity and clothes on the floor and she would just make a mess and that was just her MO. So Tressie was convinced that if Marina did make it back home, it was for a very short time and she was not there long. So now this man that drove her home, he of course is going to be the first point of attention in this case. When the police first learn about Marina's disappearance, They learn that she took a ride from a regular customer to get home back to her apartment that evening. They were given a description of this man and they were given a description of his car and they set out to find him so they could question him. It took three weeks for this man to come forward. This man's car and description was all over the news. Everyone in the area knew they were looking for him. Yet it was three weeks before this man came forward. It was learned that he did have a dark past and a criminal history, but not too many details have emerged on that. He told police that he dropped her off at this pizza place, which had been closed down and was actually right across the street from her apartment, although he didn't know that at the time. But he dropped her off there as she asked him to, and then he left. And that was all he could give police. There's no cameras, there was no surveillance that was found, and there were no witnesses that saw this happen. So police were really baffled. They could not confirm or deny that this happened. This man was given a lie detector test, and he passed. So police never really looked at him as a suspect. I don't think they ever completely discarded him, but he was never looked at as an actual suspect. So now let's talk about the married man she was having an affair with for a minute, because in my opinion, he might actually be the most sketchy of them all. This man named Toby was actually a close family friend and had even spent a lot of time with the family when Tressie was pregnant with Marina. Tressie even talked about how he would 
feel Marina kick while she was pregnant and how close he was to Marina's father, John, at that time. Now, fast forward 17 years later, he is now secretly sleeping with Marina and having an affair with this child. Marina had confided in her mom about this as they were very close. Tressie says that Marina would tell her everything. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything about Marina's life, she would disclose to Tressie, according to Tressie. So Toby, being a family friend, was approached and confronted about this affair, and he readily admitted it. He did not deny it, and Tressie did not approve of the relationship, but she was okay with it, if that makes sense. So she didn't She says she didn't approve of it, but she also went out to eat with them. She talked about a day where they all went out for Chinese for lunch, the three of them. So it's kind of interesting dynamic there. This man that was her friend for so long is now sleeping with her 17-year-old daughter, and he's married. So uh, people throughout the town kind of knew that Toby and Marina were having this affair. It wasn't that he really even tried to keep it a secret, so a lot of people knew. It has also come out that Toby was the one having this party that she was planning on going to on New Year's Eve. So investigators start questioning people from the party. They learned that Toby had actually asked a woman at the party to call Marina over and over and try to locate her as she hadn't arrived at the party yet. This woman stated that she did, but the phone kept going straight to voicemail, never even ringing. What's interesting is... Toby himself never called Marina. He asked this woman to call her and try to track her down instead. Now, investigators also discover that as Marina was leaving work the night she disappeared, she was actually on the phone with Toby. The last words she supposedly said to him were, Oh shit, it's DJ, as she had seen her ex-boyfriend walk up. So she hung up with Toby indicating that she'd call him back, but she never did. So Toby ends up helping the family with the search. Tressie thought the way this played out was really odd, as Marina, remember, was estranged from her father's family. And as they came into town to help search, Toby was ignoring all of Tressie's requests to help search or to answer questions. He wasn't answering her Facebook messages. He wasn't returning her calls. Basically, he was ignoring Tressie completely. But when Marina's father and her father's family came into town to help search, he immediately jumped on board with them and started helping with the search. There could be a lot of reasons that that happens that way, but it's definitely an interesting point. Another thing that they learn is that Toby had a key to her apartment, which makes complete sense to me because he was the one who helped her get the apartment in the first place. What's also interesting is that there were a a good handful of people in this case that took a polygraph test and Toby was not one of them. I don't know if he was asked to take one or if the police never even approached him to see if he would be willing to do that. So as they search the apartment looking for any type of clues, Tressie does take note of one interesting thing she discovers. Marina's journals are missing. Marina was apparently a big daily journal writer. And so much so, Tressie had seen these journals on multiple occasions. So shortly after Marina goes missing, one of the first things Tressie does is go for these journals. Maybe the last entries could give some clues as to people she had been interacting with or what her mental state of mind was. But the journals were nowhere to be found, which Tressie found very odd. Now, there is another interesting character that enters this puzzle as the investigation continues. There was a convicted murderer living in her apartment building. Her apartment building had two residences that were occupied. And I don't know if it was just a duplex, if it was a, if there were vacant units, I'm not sure what the setup of it is, but there was only two in her building 
occupied and it was herself and this convicted murderer living in this building. This man, Vernon Gale Briner, murdered a 19-year-old girl in the 1970s, I believe it was 1976, and was known as the Aurora College Killer. He had been released in 2012, two years before Marina went missing, and now was living in her apartment building. It is important to say that there's no evidence linking him to Marina's disappearance and that he actually had an alibi for that night as he was at work. However, it is a questionable coincidence and there is plenty of info that can be found on Vernon Gale Briner online if you are curious. Now let's talk for a quick second about DJ because I'm sure everybody is or has been wondering what about the ex-boyfriend. So DJ, Marina's ex-boyfriend, did take a polygraph test and passed. He helped everyone in the search and was very forthcoming and, and never was a suspect with the police or Marina's mother. In fact, she really liked DJ and appreciated all of his help. And it seemed as if it was her and DJ doing a lot of the searching and investigating themselves. However, Marina's father's side of the family maintains belief that DJ had something to do with her disappearance. Tressie will wholeheartedly disagree with that. Remember, it was DJ that approached her at the store when she was leaving, so he was around at the time of the disappearance. He did say he saw her get in the car with that gentleman, but he also witnessed them drive away, and that was the last he had seen of her. No witnesses have come forward to corroborate what DJ may have done right after that, but there's no evidence pointing him to the disappearance either. And even though they had been in in an on-again, off-again relationship, and they were currently in in the off side of things, he was head over heels in love with Marina, and everybody knew it. So they had a baby together. So he is definitely someone to consider in this case, but there's a lot of people that are adamant that he had nothing to do with it. And he did pass the polygraph. Unfortunately, on February 12th, 2015, just six weeks after Marina disappeared, DJ was hanging out at a bar and he was talking to a girl there. This girl told DJ that another guy named Michael Rogers had been with Marina And DJ immediately got mad and ran to confront this Michael Rogers. I don't know if there was anything or if this had anything to do with her disappearance or if DJ was just upset thinking that Michael had been with Marina before she disappeared and that just angered him. But DJ confronts Michael. A fight ensued and DJ was stabbed and ends up dying. So February 12th, 2015, one of the main players in this case, DJ Lockhart, was stabbed to death in a fight. Michael Rogers was not charged with anything as the incident was ruled self-defense. So a lot of people have, the people that did think DJ had something to do with it, now have kind of laid off the search efforts. It's kind of fallen out of the eye, public eye for them because... DJ is no longer here. So they feel that they won't get the answers that they need and that there's no possibility that they even would if DJ isn't here to give them. However, Tressie, again, still maintains that it was not DJ and is aggressively searching and campaigning to keep her daughter in the public eye and to keep people searching for what happened to her. So we have no signs of Marina Bolter after 6 p.m. on New Year's Eve 2014. There is no activity on her social media. There's no additional cell phone activity. No one has heard from her. There's been no physical evidence. None of her belongings have ever been found. No body has ever been found. No evidence to suggest foul play. It's just as if she vanished into thin air. Although No one has officially ever been announced as a suspect in this case. The general public has a few different theories. 
five to be exact. Number one, the unspecified man who drove her home. Number two, DJ Lockhart, the ex-boyfriend. Number three, Toby, the current boyfriend, the married man. Number four, Vernon Gail Briner, the neighbor. Or even number five, a complete stranger happened across her path after she was dropped off. So what do you think happened to Marina Bolter? Do you think any one of those people had anything to do with her disappearance? Do you think any of them know what happened to Marina? So it's now been six years since Marina Bolter went missing. Six years. Her son has since been adopted and her family continues to search for answers. Her sister-in-law, Ashley, runs a Facebook page that is continually updated and the family continues to beg the public for help, try to raise money to keep searching. At one point, they organized some events to help raise money and the mom, I believe, walked through town, did a 15-mile walk with a sign and took donations as she was trying to raise money for a billboard. There is definitely... A lot of family interaction on these Facebook pages. There's actually a few of them if you look it up. I definitely suggest you do if you'd like to learn more about Marina Bolter and her disappearance. I also want to recommend the Unfound podcast for a lengthy interview that is done with Marina's mother, Tressie. If you have any information as to the whereabouts of Marina Bolter or any information at all regarding her case, please contact the Bloomfield Police Department at 812-332-4411 or the Indiana State Police at 812-384-4411. Please share Marina's story. The truth is out there and the family, especially her mother, needs answers. Thank you all for watching this episode. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel and help our mission to share these unsolved cases. Checking out our partner links in the description below helps support our channel also. Thanks again for tuning in. We will see you next week. And until next time, stay safe and hug your loved ones.